Okay, everyone, welcome to uh, um, Everyday Global Anglicans. It's great to have you with us on Facebook uh, Live. I'm joined with Bishop Michael Nazarelli, and uh, we also have uh, two, two guest interviewers today. Uh, and I'm going to uh, pa pass over to them in a moment, but just a, a little introduction. I'm Anna Grace, and I work for Gathercon Global. And this month, Mike Bishop Michael is going to be writing our daily devotions. Uh, you can subscribe for free on, um, on the website, www.afcon.org forward slash devotion. And uh, we're going to be hearing a bit about Bishop Michael now, getting to know him a little bit more, uh, which will hopefully help us as we um, read his devotions. And um, I'm going to pass over to, to Charles and Michelle. Charles and Michelle, tell us a little bit about yourselves. Um, Charles, why don't you go first? Right, thank you. Um, um, I'm Charles Raven, Membership Development Secretary for GAFCON. And until March, I spent a lot of time travelling the globe. Life is rather different now, but it's great to be able to use a technology to keep in touch with people in the global GAFCON family. Um, I now live in Sheffield in England, um, but had four years from 2012 to 2016 working in Kenya for Archbishop Eliud Wabakala when he was chairman of GAFCON, which was a wonderful experience. So it's a great privilege to be able to share in this global family of God. Wonderful. And Michelle, tell us a bit about yourself. Hey, thank you, Anna Grace, for this opportunity. Um, as, you, as you said, I'm Michelle, and I live in Lahore in Pakistan, where I am development officer at the Lahore College of Theology, uh, where we have about 70 students who are preparing to go out into ministry um, about four years worth of students and they're all home right now because we had to close down campus because of COVID-19. We miss them terribly but we have been working with them online, getting courses up and working busily for that just to make sure that everyone's connected and it's been an incredible opportunity and experience to just be sustained by God's grace and goodness in these times. So yes, thank you. That's a pleasure. Okay, well, we're just going to, well, as, as um, Charles, Michelle and, and Bishop Michael have a little round the table chat. If you have any questions, do um, write them in the comments. Uh, but Michelle and Charles, I'll pass over to you. So go for it. Um, Bishop Michael, it's um, great to have you with us. And um, I was re reading your devotional, your first one, um, um, on um, the um, on on the th on the three vens and their great uh, uh, um, uh, and and the great impetus that they gave to mission work around the globe. Um, uh, um, would you see yourself as in some way um, a fruit of that ministry uh, and of that endeavour? Can you tell us a bit about your own? Uh, Christian and spiritual background? Well, I mean, in, in a way, the, uh, quite a large part of the Anglican communion is a fruit of the Venn's work. Um, and in that sense, uh, because uh, the last two were very prominent with the Church Missionary Society, as I've said in my devotional, um, CMS had a huge impact uh, in the part of the world from where I come, Pakistan. And um, I was first uh, discerned for ordination by Bishop Chanduray, the Bishop of Karachi at that time, uh, who was a great um, evangelical bishop and um, himself uh, came to Christ from another religious tradition, was a great Bible translator, um, and um, um, certainly a fruit of the CMS in, in that sense, if you like. He also invited many people from CMS in, uh, from different parts of the world to do pioneering uh, evangelistic work in the diocese. And um, he said to me once, um, 
when uh, he was interviewing me, he said, uh, well, yes, don't forget, he said, I am an evangelical, but I'm also a bishop in the apostolic succession. And um, I thought that was a, a good reply to give a young ordinand at that time who might get uppity. Um, so yes, the answer is yes, but I can talk about myself later if you, if you wish. Mm. And um, from that background, you then became, if I remember rightly, the 104th Bishop of Rochester. Six, uh, 106. 106. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and um, where, where, where do you where, where, where do you live now? Are you still in that in that part of England? Yes, we live still in Kent, um, but quite a lot of my work is either in London or in Oxford. So I know it doesn't make geographical sense, but it mm. makes family sense for us, which is which is why we live here still. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And as you've been uh, preparing the, these uh, devotions for us, um, have there been things which you felt that God has been putting on your heart in a, in a fresh way as you've been thinking and praying about these things? I know that you're, you're following the, the lectionary, um, the, the church's pattern of, of prayer, um, which uh, brings with it a lot of... Um, um, encouragement and helps to keep our collective memory alive um, but um, have there been particular things that you felt that have come to you um, as you've been preparing? Well I haven't done it all yet of course but uh, what I have done yes um, I think the uh, well I begin each time with an exposition of the Bible reading um, for the day and um, the one with the Vens was about Jesus healing the, the slave, the beloved slave of the centurion. Uh, and it reminded me again that St. Matthew's Gospel is a, is a Jewish Gospel in, in many ways. It's oriented towards the Jewish people. But it also has this dimension of universality from the beginning. Uh, you have the Magi coming from the east. Uh, you have the Syro-Phoenician uh, or the Canaanite woman, you know, traditionally the enemies of the Jewish people. Uh, you have, of course, the Great Commission at the, at the end. But here you have the story about the centurion who is a Roman soldier in the service of a tyrannical local ruler, uh, Herod Antipas. Uh, and uh, yet Jesus says about him, I've not found such faith even in Israel. Yeah. I mean, that's quite a remarkable thing um, for us to see. So universal mission, the worldwide mission of the church is not simply invented by the church. Uh, it's actually uh, intrinsic to the mission of Jesus himself. Mm. Um, then there was the uh, the reading about the visitation of the Blessed Virgin Mary to Elizabeth. And that says so much about who Jesus is, because when Mary arrives, um, uh, Elizabeth greets her with a loud cry, it says in the, in the reading. And uh, the babe leaps in her womb. And the word used for the babe, for John the Baptist, still in the womb, is the same word as is used for the infant Jesus in the next chapter. Uh, Jesus in Mary's womb is about three or four weeks old, I would have thought. Um, uh, and yet uh, Elizabeth says to Mary, who am I that the mother of the Lord of me, I think that's the literal translation, should come to me. Mm -hmm. So that says something about life in the womb. Uh, and then, of course, we had Thomas's great confession. You know, I think Thomas gets a very rough deal by being called doubting Thomas and all sorts of things like that. I think he should be called confessing and believing Thomas. And of course, from the point of view of um, Southwest Asia and um, uh, that area generally, he is also missionary Thomas, who took the gospel there for mm. the first time. 
Well, with you having said that, Bishop Michael, I'm just thinking of um, your, your students. You're very involved with the Lahore College of Theology. You're with us most of the time. We're very sad that you missed your trip to, to Lahore to be with the students. You've been missed dearly. Yeah, um, well, I'm very sad too. <laughs> yes. Uh, we look forward to you being with us um, soon. Um, while you were working on this, while you were looking at this, you just mentioned St. Thomas. Um, is there any fresh bread um, for the students? Um, anything specific that, that struck you that would, be, that would be pertinent to them and minister to them at this time? About St. Thomas, you mean? Yes. Or, yeah. Well, I think the, the more I uh, consider the, the story, the more likely I think it is that Thomas came to Northwest India, that is to say now what is now Pakistan. Um, the archaeological and the historical evidence is all in favor of it, as well as the linguistic, uh, because uh, the discoveries have shown that both Greek and Aramaic were spoken in the Gandhara civilization of North, Northwest India, now Pakistan. And so the question, you know, if, if Thomas came, in what language did he preach to the people uh, is, is answered. I mean, it's these incidental things that convince people. If he went to South India, where, of course, there are living communities still, well, very much so, that claim to, be, uh, to have been evangelized by him, then he would have had to travel about 2,000 miles um, to get to South India. And then the question is, how did they understand his preaching? Well, there were Jewish communities in South India, trading communities, and they would have had to translate for him. So I think it says something about cross-cultural mission. And I know that um, one of the aims of the Lahore College of Theology is to train people to cross cultures. And Thomas is a great crosser of cultures. Mm -hmm. And talking of crossing cultures, uh, Bishop Michael, um, you've been very involved with the GAFCON movement, which is a, a, a global and uh, very much a cross-cultural movement um, since the first conference back in 2008. Um, I was there too, and um, it was probably one of the most important few days and experiences of my whole Christian life. Um, mm. what would what, what what is your abiding memory of uh, of, of of that time as as somebody who was uh, sort of uh, straddles cultures? Um, uh, uh, w what encouragement did you find by being in Jerusalem in two thousand and eight? Yes, well, good question. Um, I mean, Valerie actually got there before I did. Um, so she was there for longer. Uh, I arrived late because I had ordinations in the diocese. Uh, when I arrived, I was met immediately by Israeli security. Uh, and they said, um, we will not allow you to be out of our sight when you are outside your room for the duration of your stay because they had some credible information they said that something might happen. So anyway, they, they did that. I don't know if you remember that, but... Well, I, I remember standing with you on the steps of David, um, yeah. and I just happened to be standing next to you, and I was aware of some Mossad types around. Yes, yes. I suddenly <laughs> realised that this was quite a dangerous... You were quite a dangerous person to be next to. But, uh, yes, well, anyway. no, with them around, <laughs> probably not, but... But it did constrain me a bit because they told me where to sit for dinner and, you know, things like that. And I could see that people might think that I was being standoffish, but I actually wasn't being allowed to sit wherever I liked. Um, anyway, that's one thing. But um, when I arrived in the hall, uh, people were, I think uh, Archbishop Henry had just finished his Bible reading and people were singing and praising God. 
And uh, there were charismatics there, there were evangelicals there, there were Anglo-Catholics there. And I thought to myself, why can the Anglican communion not be like this? Mm. Mm. That has been reinforced for me at every GAFCON type gathering. Uh, if we can do it, if GAFCON can do this, why cannot the whole of the communion? What is the problem? And really, the problem in the end has to be traced back to a small number of Western elites who have decided that traditional, historic, biblical Christianity is not good enough for them and they've got to reinvent something different. Mm. Mm. Well, I, I remember um, uh, getting into some difficulty myself on the way to Jerusalem um, because I had about 10 copies of this book <laughs> in my case <laughs> by yes, yeah. Bishop Michael Nazareth. Well, well, and well I, was, I was asked by security um, whether I was whether these I was carrying these for myself or for somebody else, <laughs> but of course there were I think hundreds of us who were taking these books um, uh, uh, because it was the easiest way to get them there. And um, so anyway, I'll give our viewers a quick plug for Bishop Michael's um, very readable um, book on the unique and universal Christ. A great exercise in. Christology. Um, can we move forward 10 years to 2018? We were back in Jerusalem then for, mm. uh, for the third uh, great GAFCON assembly, um, nearly twice as many people there. Um, how did you feel that the GAFCON movement had changed over those, and, uh, and developed over those 10 years? Well, the gathering was larger, of course. Um, nearly twice the size, I think. Um, it was much more organized. I mean, we'd got networks, for instance, working, which we didn't have in the first or even the second conference. Um, I think that we spent a lot more time praying with people um, than we had in, in Jerusalem 1 and perhaps even in Nairobi. And the singing was great. I mean, I think the choirs were, were absolutely first class and um, the Kenyan choir, for instance. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, I was, when I got up to uh, do my address, I discovered that the clock was going the wrong way and this nonplussed me for a bit. Uh, but I think that was the only sort of hitch that I, I experienced. Yeah, wonderful. Um, and then um, uh, in, in March last year, you were with us, um, as was Michelle, for our conference in Dubai, um, which was for those who, for uh, political reasons, hadn't been able to get visas to Israel and were offer, often operating in um, circumstances of very considerable difficulty for Christian witness and um, out of that conference came our Suffering Church um, network. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know that Michelle has a particular interest in, in that area so um, I, I don't want to um, monopolize you so um, I'll, I'll hand over to Michelle at the, at, at the moment, um, because we, we're living, she and I live in very different contexts. Um, and uh, so, um, Michelle, what, what are the, uh, perhaps there are some um, uh, issues to do with suffer, the suffering church you'd like to explore with Bishop? Oh, it was, it, yes. Um... It was very interesting to be there at that point at the at G G nineteen in Dubai, mm -hmm. and just see how it was such a it was, uh, Bishop Michael. It just seemed like such a natural progression to start talking about a suffering church network, mm -hmm. to um, to start really in exploring further how important that the story of of uh, sustaining orthodoxy in the church and sustaining those that suffer for the for uh, for, the, for the sake of Christ. Um, it, it was a very natural progression. It was the right time to start talking about that. 
and to start raising the profile of persecution within uh, within the GAFCON community. Would you like to say something more about that, Bishop Michael? Yes, again, I think it was a very moving occasion. We had uh, quite a lot of difficulty getting everyone there, but I think we got most people there, which was not the case for Jerusalem, 2018, for instance. Uh, everyone we wanted to be there, more or less, was there, and that was a matter for rejoicing. Um, what struck me then was that um, suffering Christians are biblical and orthodox Christians. I don't think I've ever met um, somebody suffering for their faith who's radically questioning its very basis. Uh, so that means we've got an enormous um, treasure there of witness, uh, not just to the to the suffering and what that means. I mean that's very important but that they're witnessing to the nature of the gospel, to what actually it means. And I hope that um, the insight of the suffering church and of suffering Christians is always near the center of Gafcon's concerns and not on the margins. There is a, there, it, it's, it's essential for both um, for, for the nar narrative on orthodoxy as well as the, the narrative on persecution and suffering to go hand in hand. Um, very often, like for example, in the, in the last few months with the whole crisis on Corona and the challenges that's posed to the individual, um, mm. it's, it's, brought, it's brought out the more practical side of living out that orthodoxy, of living out that, that pure Christianity. Um, how does adhering to and living that sustainable Christian faith, how does that impact communities? How have you seen that? How, give us some stories of encouragement because people are in isolation. They're not hearing these things and they're, they're beginning to feel alone. And there is a lot of um, temptation to compromise. Well, I think faithfulness, I mean, the, the stories are about... Uh about faithfulness. Um, um, let's um, think of this uh, woman who is an evangelist and um, who um, whose evangelism is really uh, taking bus trips. And um, her aim is to sit next to a woman um, on a bus journey and to have evangelized her by the end of that journey and to have given her a New Testament or whatever. Uh, well, she's paid a very high price for this um, in her context. Um, but uh, there is a lot for us to learn in how to use our time, even time that we think is fallow time or even wasted time for the sake of communicating the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, the um, the courage of people, I um, remember someone who had come to Christ from another faith background who was a leader in the church, uh, who would go every summer to a hill station where people were coming for their summer holidays. And uh, he, with an open Bible in his hand, he would preach on the roadside. And um, one or two of us occasionally had the courage to accompany him, but he did it all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a very distinguished man, and he brought many people um, to Christ. Um, but uh, he also experienced a great deal of suffering because of uh, what he was doing and his courage in doing it. So there are, there are so many stories uh, of how, uh, well, I don't know which comes first, whether it's the suffering or the faithfulness that comes first. I, mm -hmm. I expect it's the faithfulness gives rise to the suffering because otherwise you would just compromise, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. uh, but then the suffering, I think, reinforces the faithfulness because people know that is the way 
that they will get through the suffering, keeping close to Jesus. Thank you, Bishop Michael. That's so helpful. Um, I just want to um, pick up on some of the Facebook comments that we've had, because we've got people joining us from um, all over the world, which is really wonderful. And um, we've had a, a fantastic comment from uh, Daniel. Um, he says, good to see Charles and hear Bishop Michael speak. I've recently enjoyed reading his contribution in Reformation and Anglicanism. That was a book that we uh, um, we took with us to, uh, to, to I remember, um, having a look, reading a bit of it in Dubai. And can you tell us a bit, of, bit about that, Bishop Michael, that book? Yes, this was really a trailer. This, that book is a trailer and other books are to follow. Uh, uh, the idea was to ask how uh, Anglicanism can help us in mission, uh, in evangelism, in church planting, um, in pastoral work. Um, what does the tradition actually give us? So what we did in that book was for the different authors, those who were going to author separate volumes, to write chapters in the book. Um, so I wrote a chapter, Archbishop uh, Ben Kwashi wrote a chapter, um, um, uh, Ashley Null wrote a chapter, and uh, um, John, one of the editors uh, of the book, he wrote a chapter. Um, I have just written my volume uh, of What Is To Follow, and that should be published soon. I was um, hoping it might be published for Kigali. Of course, Kigali didn't happen, uh, but it may be published. Well, I hope it will be published by the next Kigali if that happens, uh, the Bishop's Conference. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that was basically what was behind it. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, for those who might not be aware of, about the um, Kigali Conference, could you just tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, the idea was uh, uh, to gather together bishops uh, from around the communion uh, who wanted to come together. I, I think Professor Owen Chadwick once said, uh, where there are bishops, they'll find a way of coming together. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think they need to come together. Uh, because they have common concerns, um, uh, common problems, opportunities that they need to discuss together to find a way through them. Uh, in this case, there was a special reason as well. Um, some of these bishops had not been invited to the 10 yearly Lambeth Conference uh, of Anglican bishops. And some had decided not to go because uh, there were people going to be at the Lambeth Conference who had well departed from any kind of understanding of orthodox belief and practice. And they, whilst we should always be willing to meet with people and talk with them, uh, being in the council of bishops uh, to teach the faithful is another matter. Uh, so I think those were the reasons why uh, Kigali was uh, mooted um, and planned for. I'm sorry it didn't take place. I hope that it will take place in, in the future in some way, mm -hmm. uh, because I think it's needed. We, we, we are committed to doing it next year. Um, Praise the Lord. Yep. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you, Bishop Michael. I just want to, uh, for anyone who's just joined, joined us, you're listening to and watching Everyday Global Anglicans. Um, we are interviewing Bishop Michael Nazarelli, who's writing our Lift Up Your Hearts devotions throughout July. You can subscribe. The link is in the comments. It's all for free. Um, and also, Bishop Michael has been recording uh, his devotions as well, so you can listen to them. And actually, um, our last contributor, Jeremy Marshall, he... He recorded them last month and they were so popular um the recordings that is um that our website went down over the weekend so, um, so uh, well, we well that won't happen this um, <laughs> we think so, so you can listen as much as you want to the rifles as well so um so don't hold back um and uh, yeah we're joined with charles and michelle who 
I'll just uh, interview Bishop Michael, find out a little bit more about him and his devotions. Um, but I'll I'll uh, hand back to Charles. Um, for his next yeah. uh, well, I, I, we are very privileged to have this time with you, Bishop Michael, and you know the time that you're giving. Uh, for these devotions, because I know that they're not the sort of thing that can just be knocked off in a few minutes. Um, you uh, have the reputation in the UK and globally as a public intellectual. Um, I mean, you write, although you've written books on theology, um, you've written very widely about society and you contribute to mainstream uh, magazines uh, uh, and um, and and, uh, uh, and newspapers. Um, I suppose that um, uh, uh, although you, I don't, I don't suppose for a moment you would uh, style yourself in this way. Um, that um, you are one of our prophetic voices um, in Western Christianity. Um, it seems to me you have a, a particular vantage point as. Um, somebody who belongs to uh, whose background is an ethnic minority, um, but um, as a bishop and as a, as an academic, you've occupied um, many places and positions in British society, which will be as identified with the establishment. Um, but you seem to have resisted its blandishments, <laughs> um, and. Uh, so I think our, uh, our, our viewers would be very interested in your take on the controversies that have broken out following the um, appalling murder of George Floyd. Um, there's been a new awareness of, the, uh, uh, of, of how embedded racism can be um, in Western societies, particularly um, in the, the um, North America and here. Um, but last uh, earlier this week, um, a UK newspaper columnist um, sharply criticised the Archbishop of Canterbury for what he said was a departure from scripture. Um, by what he meant was his reading of the Archbishop of Canterbury's comments recently that uh, white British people are guilty of racism simply because they are white. Um, and this seems to reflect the growth of identity um, politics. So how should we as people who want to be faithful to Christ and to scripture and who love justice, how should we negotiate? How should we navigate these um, troubled issues? Mm. Uh, that's a googly, isn't it? That's, that's, that ball's called a googly in cricket. <laughs> uh, that goes the opposite <laughs> way from the way you were thinking it was going. Um, well, first of all, um, Christians are both at home, wherever they are placed, and they are strangers, wherever they are. Uh, so in Pakistan, for instance, I find myself both entirely at home, as Michelle was saying just now, uh, but also a stranger because of my background and uh, because of my following of Christ. Uh, in Britain, I find myself... Uh, both at home uh, in knowing uh, what is happening in in the world uh, around me, uh, but also a stranger because what I think about what is going on is taken from the Bible and not from cultural values round about. Um, sometimes that's an advantage, sometimes it's very much a disadvantage. But that's how we, we need to live as Christians, wherever we are. So I think, you know, that's, uh, that's by way of a preface. Um, I think um, the inspiration of the civil rights movement with Martin Luther King and others uh, was, a, was from the Bible. And it was rooted in the Christian faith. 
Uh, so taking the knee, which has become so popular, was actually Martin Luther King kneeling down with his colleagues to pray mm. before the march. And I think we need to remind people of what it actually meant originally. Um, but um, things that are good in themselves and honorable in themselves can be taken over by other interests. And I think um, uh, some of what has happened, um, this particularly the violence, has been taken over by anarchists and by neo-Marxists and so on for their own ends, uh, which have very little to do with um, racial emancipation and equality and so on. Um, the campaign here that uh, you were referring to, which uh, was what the columnist was writing about, who's also the former advisor to the former prime minister, by the way, so he's not just a journalist. Um, he was talking about uh, the whole question about slavery and uh, people who have and institutions who have benefited from slavery in Britain uh, and in the United States um, and, and other countries, and uh, what should be done about that in terms of um, reparation or repentance and so on. So, uh, my view about it is that you know slavery is actually uh, universal. Nearly every society has practiced slavery at some time or other. Um, so in ancient India, for instance, in the Vedas, we find uh, regulations about how to treat slaves. In the writings of the Buddha, uh, we find such regulations. Um, the Arabs uh, had slavery before the rise of Islam and in fact were pioneers in the slave trade in Africa. Uh, and with Africa, and many of the European slavers had to learn quite a lot about this trade from the Arabs. Um, when uh, the Sindh, which is now in southern Pakistan, was conquered, uh, large numbers of the local population were enslaved, uh, both kept locally and sent abroad. Uh, the subsequent empires uh, in India, the Pathan Empire, the uh, Mughal Empire, all had slavery. And there were both Turkish and Indian slaves of these in these empires. Slavery was endemic in, in Africa. Um, and um, it was used by the local rulers for their own ends. And of course, it was the local rulers generally who sold their own people to the Arab and European slavers. So nobody is guiltless in this. This is what I'm trying to say. No one is guiltless. Um, and we all need um, to repent of, of what has happened and how we may have benefited from it. The campaign that he was writing about to remove statues and memorials uh, of people involved in slavery in some way well, the question is, where do you start and where do you stop? Uh, Aristotle, the great philosopher who's influenced so much of Western philosophy, was a staunch defender of slavery. I mean, he said there were some kinds of people who were born to be slaves, just as others were born to be free. So do we start now excising Aristotle from the curricula uh, and from any kind of public memorials of him? Where the Bible is concerned, Abraham and Sarah had slaves. David had slaves. Moses legislated about slavery. Jesus himself, as we've just been uh, discussing, uh, Jesus himself healed the slave of a Roman officer and said about him that he'd not found faith like that even in Israel. Um, St. Paul returned a runaway slave to his owner. Um, you know, uh, these are, uh, where does one stop? Um, many people who are commemorated in churches and elsewhere, in memorials and statues and so forth, 
are commemorated because they've been part of or leaders in some great event which the community wishes to remember. Now, what I say is memorializing is not necessarily celebration. I mean, no one would say that the memorials to those who died in the two world wars uh, implied that they were all virtuous in every aspect of their lives. That is not what it's there for. It's there because they gave their lives or were, or were injured or whatever in the conflict. Um, so um, where um, uh, figures in the Bible um, are concerned, except for Jesus, and this is where Christian faith is different from Islam, Except for Jesus, the Bible does not regard any of the prophets as flawless. They're all flawed human beings in one way uh, or another. Uh, and, you know, we can give examples of that. Abraham deceiving uh, people about the fact that Sarah was his wife. Um, Moses had committed murder. Um, David had committed adultery and an accompanying murder. Uh, you know, these are, these are serious sins. So, and yet they are celebrated because they had led people at crucial times uh, in the history of those people and also of our history. Um, then another criticism has been that, um, which this columnist was addressing, uh, and uh, which the Archbishop of Canterbury had also addressed, was that um, in Western art, uh, many figures in the Bible are portrayed as white. Um, well, I think that is true, but uh, that is uh, the case um, with every culture and uh, the conventions of, uh, and art forms uh, often uh, mean that people pro depict uh, such figures like Jesus or Mary or the saints in ways that are familiar to them. So if you look at an Ethiopian icon, you will see the saints and Jesus and Mary as dark-skinned. If you see Chinese paintings, there's a wonderful collection of Jesus through Asian eyes uh, kept in the university in Yale uh, by Asian artists. And it depicts Jesus in a whole variety of Asian cultures. Uh, now, this is entirely understandable and even to be promoted, uh, provided that there is a corrective to this, that uh, we, by looking at how other cultures portray Jesus, uh, we are conscious of the relativism of our own culture. Uh, and also with reference to the historic, always to the historic person who was a Middle Eastern Jew. There's been comment in the press saying, we don't know what Middle Eastern Jews look like. Well, I'm surprised by that because I know many Middle Eastern and Indian Jews and I know precisely how they look like. Um, Jews from the Yemen are numerous in Israel and you can go to their synagogues and find out exactly what a Middle Eastern Jew might have looked like. So um, then um, the, the question, sorry, is this getting to, do you want to, <laughs> me to stop? I mean, well, I think there was this idea of collective guilt, wasn't there? That simply yes. because of your racial identity, uh, in this case being white, you are, I mean, and I think we probably don't want to get into this, but it, it, it re probably relates into critical race theory. Um, yes. Uh, and various sort of neo-Marxist understandings of society. So there's a sense that the individual is being submerged in the, in the collective. I think that's really Nick Timothy's uh, particular concern about Justin Welby's... Yes. Well, I mean, race theory itself, of course, has to be criticised. I mean, hmm. you know, the whole notion... Um, the, the fathers continually referred to Christians as the third race or as the new race. Mm. Uh, so the old is gone. You know, mm. there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither Scythian nor Hellenistic or whatever. Uh, this is, 
the new humanity in Christ is a new project. And where slavery is concerned, uh, of course, uh, slaves have been of every, every possible color. I mean, Aristotle uh, claimed that you could um, enslave people from the north, that is to say, from what is now um, Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, because they had courage without intelligence. And he said you could enslave Orientals because they had intelligence without courage. Now, the Greeks, of course, had both. And um, so, um, be, you know, everyone um, is part of this history, as I was saying. But from the Christian point of view, from the very beginning, there is, uh, first of all, a raising of the status of slaves at a time when the church could not do much else because of its limitations as a suffering and oppressed group. Then there began uh, this great movement, which is already hinted at in the New Testament, uh, of the manumission of slaves, so that congregations would buy the freedom of slaves in the congregation. Uh, and that got to such an extent that Constantine, when he became more favorable to Christianity, gave bishops the authority to manumit slaves. Uh, Rodney Stark, the sociologist, um, tells us that wherever Christianity has advanced, slavery has retreated. So in Western Europe, as the Christian faith grew, uh, slavery uh, became almost non-existent. In um, already we find Charlemagne and the bishops in the eighth century speaking against slavery, forbidding it. And in this country, in Britain, Saint Anselm, Archbishop of Canterbury, outlawed slavery at the Council of Westminster in 1102, to be to be precise. Uh, when slavery began to grow again, uh, because of, this, uh, of the trade across the Atlantic, uh, apostolic figures like Bishop Bartolome uh, Las Casas in Mexico, uh, the Dominican teachers in the University of Salamanca, uh, took up uh, the case of uh, the indigenous people of the Americas against the most powerful people in Europe at that time, the Spanish and Portuguese empires. And it was the so-called humanists who backed Aristotle's view of slavery, not the Christians, not those who were arguing from a biblical point of view. Las Casas uh, is the founder, I think, of what we call these days uh, human rights theory. Um, and John Locke followed him uh, to a very great extent, even though he was interested in, in holding slaves himself. Uh, but his, that is not what his argument leads to. So when the movement by evangelicals uh, in this country began uh, to end the slave trade and slavery, these people were standing on the shoulders of giants who had gone before. Uh, and the the struggle against the slave trade and of slavery in this country in the 18th and 19th centuries is a perfectly virtuous page in our history. Why are we not talking about that? You know, why are we talking about the involvement in slavery, which is true, we should talk about it, but then why not the campaign to end it, and when it was ended, the campaign to maintain it. So the Church Missionary Society, of which I was General Secretary, and the Royal Navy habitually intercepted slaver ships off the coast of West Africa, mm. freed the captives, and settled them in colonies, you know, talking about colonialism, here is an example of it, settled them in colonies like Sierra Leone. That's how Sierra Leone came into existence. Nobody's talking about that kind of colonialism. Why not? And then these freed captives opened up Nigeria. Uh, so, you know, Bishop Crowther was a Sierra Leonean freed captive. 
Um, it's a long story, but you know we need to tell this story. I mean, this is uh, that's the point, and every kind of empire can be glorified in our media. I've just been watching an excellent series on the Persian empires. Uh, you can have the Mughal Empire, all sorts of empires can be glorified except the British. Well, uh, the British Empire was a mixture of good and bad. Some empires are not, not a mixture. They can be wholly bad or even evil. But the British Empire was a mixture. There's no question that the the white nabobs, as they were called, of the East India Company enriched themselves at the expense of the Indian population. No, no question about that. Uh, but what else did they do? Uh, I mean, the, uh, the social reforms, the introduction of education, the emancipation of women, uh, the forbidding of widows throwing themselves on the funeral pyres of their dead husbands, um, the marginalization of the caste system, um, the introduction of partial, admittedly, and patchy democracy, but nevertheless, the introduction of democracy, uh, judicial processes, uh, preventing the revenue system from becoming um, simply a way of prominent people enriching themselves. I mean, all these, the British Empire did. Uh, Roads and railways were built, of course, for the convenience of the British, but they also created huge mobility in a country like India and probably is the reason why people began to think of a united India in the first place. So we have to balance the bad with the good. And, you know, th this is simply not a service to truth to just emphasize one side and not the other. Mm. Uh, yeah, thank you, Bishop. Well, this has been so illuminating. Um, I think our time is probably coming to an end. So I just want to, would like to give uh, Michelle an opportunity to ask you a, a final question as we come to the end of our time. Yeah, we had a little power cut last time I was asking a question. Um, the, uh, this is precisely what you've just said is, um, goes back to Charles saying that your, your, your role is your role in the prophetic. Um, and we give thanks to the Lord for that. Um, really the uh, t talking about, just talking about uh, emancipation, talking about the crisis that we're going through right now. Um, in the midst of that, we constantly hear stories about um, young uh, about young people who are caught in these slave-like situations here in our context. Mm. Um, there have been some really, really heartbreaking stories in the last few months coming out of, of similar situations where people are enslaved, where uh, not, not, maybe not just as uh, domestic labor, but also enslaved to the laws that we've inherited that continue to flourish and, and, um, and bring that suffering to the church um, and, and, and so many other aspects of that. In the midst of that, I go back to the title of your book, A U Unique and Universal Christ. And in the midst of that, we're reminded of a unique faith that we hold on to. And we, uh, we, are, we are called to really uh, adhere to. And in that same vein of the prophetic Bishop Michael, would, you know, just, Speak into that for us. Uh, what are the, the characteristics of this unique faith in this multicultural, multi-religious uh, uh, multi contexts that we engage with every day, whether it's uh, secular, whether it is um, a Southwest Asian relig religious context. But in the midst of all of that, the prophetic is always calling us to a righteous agenda. Hmm. And in the midst of that, we've got to engage with each other internally as a church with, in different realities. Um, what is our expectation of our walk with Jesus to ensure that the impact of that righteous agenda 
for us and for the generations to come is a lasting one. And how can we sustain one another um, as that, as there's so much erosion around us? Hmm. Well, thank you. Um, I think a lot of the answer is in the question. Um, um, as that, as there's so much erosion around us. I mean, Jesus has to be at the center. Um, so people often ask me why I'm a Christian. And I say, well, show me another like Jesus. And so far, no one has been able to do this. So it is um, who Jesus is. Uh, this is not just about uh, his person. It's also about um, what he does. I mean, there's a popular saying, as you know, uh, where you are, that there is healing in the breath of Jesus. But about who can we say that? There's healing in the breath of Jesus. Uh, so... Um, the following of Jesus, um, the imitation of Christ, so that to seek to do what Jesus does uh, in our Christian following, I mean, that is, that is extremely important. Um, if we are really wanting uh, to change things where slavery is concerned, let us take part in those movements that are trying to end slavery today. Uh, whether it is women who've been abducted and brought to the West uh, for sex slavery, or whether it is domestic slavery that is still practiced in many parts of the world. Uh, um, I was just reading the other day about um, how uh, domestic workers uh, are treated, for instance, in some parts of the Gulf. Um, there is the caste system, uh, the way in which untouchables are treated in, in India. Uh, there is the discrimination against people who are suffering because of their faith and exclusion. I mean, there are all these issues uh, for us to address. They're live issues. Let's put our resources, uh, personal and financial, rather than going on and on about something that happened in the past and for which Christians, uh, where Christians were responsible uh, for its abolition. You know, um, but it's not just a matter of the past, it's what are we doing today as Christians? Uh, and what are we doing today? It's fine to sort of demonstrate in London and break a few windows. But that doesn't do anything about those who are in slavery today. Let us give money. Let us go. Let us um, bring um, international law to bear on people who are engaged in these practices. I mean, all of these things uh, can and should be done. Uh, and there are movements that are doing it. Let's go and join them and help them. Where is the tipping point? Where is the... Um, in, in the conversation and the narrative, where's the tipping point where we are at risk uh, as Christians, where we can be at risk of di diverting and deviating um, and this becoming a Christless narrative? Yes. I think if you, uh, if you simply buy the kind of neo-Marxist uh, narrative, um, then that it does become Christless. It becomes, everyone becomes a victim. And everyone then has to be liberated from that victimhood. Uh, but actually, true liberation is only through Christ. It's the liberation of the heart and the soul in the first place. But it also leads to social and political liberation. So... Um, if we are going to be political activists or social activists, let's be Christian political activists and social activists. Not, let us not derive our theory uh, from an alien philosophy that is godless by definition. Um, the, um, I think it's, it, it's not a tipping point question so much as a jumping on the bandwagon question. Uh, with 24-hour media coverage, there is a great temptation for Christian leaders uh, of every kind to
to jump onto the next bandwagon uh, and to buy its assumptions rather than to examine them and challenge them if necessary. I mean, you're talking about uh, the prophetic. Um, I think um, it is good to be reluctant to be a prophet. I mean, Jeremiah was notably reluctant about being a prophet. So was Amos. It's not an easy thing. Um, in, the, in the Older Testament, we find that uh, prophets quite often had marks of beatings on their backs because of their unpopularity. Um, and, you know, um, to be quite honest, I don't in any way wish to be a prophet, but sometimes you have to say things for the sake of the gospel because they would otherwise be left unsaid. Well, Bishop Michael, thank you so much um, for and um, Michelle and Charles for your your questions. Bishop Michael, you've given us so much to think about and pray about, and thank you for uh, focusing um, our thoughts on the person of Christ as we um, navigate through through the crises that we see around us at the moment. Thank you so much, and uh, we really look forward to. Um, listening and reading your devotions over the, this next month. Thank you so much for writing them. And, bless you. Um, oh, no, bless you. And then, um, yeah, subscribe um, on the website. Um, it, the link is in the comments as well. It's all free. Uh, so do enjoy those. And we hope and pray that they um, enrich your walk with the Lord. And um, I just want to say a huge thank you, Bishop Michael, for joining us today, to Michelle and, and Charles as well. Thank you so much. And thank you um, for joining us uh, on this on this um, live interview. And um, yeah, subscribe. That's the that's the last thing to do. And um, a little farewell from us. So thank you. Thanks for joining everyone. Bye.